Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time an old Spanish woman who cared, a red-headed mink who didn't, and a green suede button beside a cough. All led me to a wounded man with a gun in his hand, cornered on a warehouse roof. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Man on the Roof. Senora Andrade, who told me that her only boy was heading for a lot of trouble and that I had to stop him. The Andrade home stood out like a thoroughbred alongside the milkman's horse in comparison to the other houses squatting on the sun-baked soil. And the Senora herself, at maybe 60 and in a cheap black cotton dress, a lace shawl and homemade slippers, was the tidiest person I'd ever seen. When she bowed from the waist in graceful greeting, I saw... A single small ivory comb was the only thing holding a mass of long gray hair in one neat bundle. Senor Marlo, you will excuse me if I do not extend you the hospitality of my house, but Pedro, uh, he likes to be named, is already gone. There is no wasting time. Of course. Uh, Peach your son, Senora, huh? And a good boy, Senor Marlo. Here. Here is a photograph of him. It is taken only a week ago on his 25th birthday. Really? He was so proud of that green jacket I made for him. It was swayed and flashing, he said. Flashing like something the rich Mr. Alex Brucher would wear. He has it on every day since then, even today. Alex Brucher? Who's that, Mrs. Andrade? Senor who owns the warehouse for furs in Los Angeles. Oh? Number 12, Commercial Street. Where my people worked until two days ago. When the trouble started. Well, what happened, Senora? It was during his lunch time. He was eating from a meal I made for him like he always does and talking to a stranger, some... Uh, how you say, senor? A man with no job all the time. A, a uh, bum, a hobo, uh, a loafer? Uh, see, a <laughs> loafer, see. He was just telling me how, how he was telling him to find the railroad yards. That, senor, is where the trouble began. Oh, please, senor Marlo, you will have a chair there. Oh, yes, thanks. Now, uh, tell me, senora, this trouble. Surely giving instructions to a loafer, as you say, didn't start it. Oh, but it did. After the lunch hour, the foreman, a senor Connor, questioned Pedro about this loafer. And when my boy said that the man was only asking for the railroad yards, this senor Connor said he was a liar. That Pedro was giving out information about the shipments of furs that he was fired Discharge. Just like that? Let's see, senor. After two years of good, hard work, 
You see, Senor Marlowe, Pedro tells me that Senor Alex Brucher has been having his shipments of first stolen on the road. Um, Hijacked? Uh, see, mm. hijacked. And it is this reason why Pedro is fired. You, uh, you want me to prove to Mr. Alex Brucher that Pete had nothing to do with his hijacking, huh? Get his job back, is that no, it? No, 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 Senor. It is too late. Why too late? Pedro already went down there this morning to do that. Oh. He went and told Senor Connor that he had nothing to do with the hijacked. And more. He told him, Senor Malo, that he was fired because of Helen Castile. Who's that? The pretty girl who for a short time now works in Senor Brucha's office. Well, then I don't understand, Senora. This Helen Castile and my boy are falling in love. But Senor Brucha also likes this girl. Oh. What happened when Pete told this to Mr. Brucher? He never did. Before he even got to speak to Senor Brucher, that devil man, Senor Connor, and some other men beat him. Caught his face, blood on his arms, his clothing torn. He came home just before I called to you. Almost dead, Senor. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, how about now? Now, Senor Marlo, Pedro has gone back. Revenge in his heart. That is why you must stop him. Senor, Senor, you must bring him home before he kills. Before it is too late. Take it easy. No, I'm not no, no, take it Pobre easy. Pobre Tito. Don't worry. I'm sure I, I can bring him back. Positive. Oh, God, Senor. It's all right. It's all right. Here, here, Senor, in this tent. I have money. Nineteen, maybe more dollars here. You take no, it. No, 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 no. Not yet, Mrs. Andrade. I have, uh, uh, I don't think it'll cost that much. We'll see, huh? Goodbye, senora. It was an hour's drive to the Brucher Fug Company warehouse on Commercial Street in downtown L.A. I started up a long cement ramp that led to a glass cage in a far corner of the warehouse marked office. It was just about the end of a working day. And when I was next to the door, let it enter. A bell someplace said that the end had arrived. You could tell the way everyone's spirits went up. Everyone except the girl inside, half leaning on a file cabinet. I figured she was Helen Castile until I got closer. The on fire red hair and green eyes with hat and shoes to match could have gotten by. But the coat she wore was mink. So was the attitude. That would never take shorthand for 40 bucks a week. Things just couldn't get that tough. Hello. You look like you lost something. Oh, is Helen still here, Helen Castile? Don't the powder knows. Maybe back before she leaves for the day, may not. No, I don't know. Oh. You a friend of hers? No, Peter and Brothers. Never heard of him. Good life. Oh. Please. Sure, sure. Now, uh, tell me, Miss... Haynes. Corey Haynes. You? Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. Miss Haynes, is Alex Brucher around? Mm-mm. Home packing is going out of town. It does mm. every other week. Important business? No, I just wanted to chat with him a while. Oh, Connor, is uh, Aris's car gas and ready for me? Yeah, it's ready. It's ready, Miss Hayes. Here are the keys. Thank you. And, Connor, please, stop wishing I were dead, will you? I can feel it, and it gives me the creep. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miss Haynes, but, well, maybe we won't be seeing so much of one another so soon. If you mean Helen Castile, Connor, she's a great secretary, period. Yeah. How are you, Mr. Marlowe? Mr. Marlowe. I'm a friend of Peter Andrade's. I want to said enough, mister. Almost too much. Now, wait a minute, Connor. Oh, what I... for? A lot of hot air? Listen, Marlowe, we've been running all kinds of trouble around here. Hijacking, short shipments, misdirected cargoes of works. So? So it all adds up to somebody on the inside helping somebody on the outside. And that ain't good. Now, take my advice, brother. Get your long nose out of this place and keep it out if you don't want it bent. It's the phone, Connor. If you lift it up, it'll stop that noise. Very funny. Hello. Oh, hello, Mr. Brucher. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I got it. Charming fella, isn't he? You'll be down here in a couple hours mm -hmm. and I'm to wait. Check. Check, Mr. Brucher. Goodbye. His master's voice. Mm -hmm. Very funny again. Uh, you'd better let me have the keys back, Miss Haynes. The boss isn't going out of town after all. He'll probably want his car. And I'll probably give it to him myself after I've run a few errands I have in mind. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. I hope we meet again in more pleasant surroundings. 
You two go to rival schools, Connor? Get out of here, Marlowe. Get out before you get the same treatment your friend Pete Andrade got. Oh, you've got to be kidding. You wouldn't do that to me, Connor. I'm not in love with Helen Castile. That goes for you, too, in spades. I don't want Connor to see us. I'm Helen Castile. How do you know who I am? There's an intercom phone in the office you just left. Yeah, I see what you mean. I knew Pete was in some trouble. I hadn't heard from him in two days. <laughs> Mr. Marlowe, what they've done to him is terrible. How do you know about it? Did Pete come to you? No, his mother hired me. I'm a private detective, which, uh, Helen brings up a sharp point. Are you sure you're not playing both sides, baby? Well, you All are right, not... save it, save it. That's all I wanted to know. What do you want... You mean you just said that to see how I'd act? Well, I had to be sure. After all, you're still working for Alex Brucher. Not anymore. I only stayed on before this because I didn't want Pete to be fired. <clears throat> Hold it. I think we've got company. It could be rats. There's some around. Yeah, with and without brass knocks. Now, listen, honey, for everybody's good, I don't want Pete mixing with Alex Brucher. Now, before you get out of here, tell me fast, where does the boss live? 41 West Adams. 41 on. West. Okay, now go. I'll cover you until you clear the place. Go on. All right. My car's across the street. If you need any help later, Mr. Marlowe... Get Marlo. going. That rat may have friends. Okay. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Helen got to the front gate, out into her car, and away without anybody bothering her. And a couple of minutes later, I covered the same smooth course, and I was beginning to believe that the rats were just that, except... When I was in behind the wheel of my coupe and heading for Adams Boulevard, I picked up a pair of headlights in my rearview mirror, which for the next 40 minutes have zigzagged, stuck like they were painted there. But finally, a traffic jam gave me all the break I needed. And a sharp right turn, followed by a lot of speed, left me free and once again on my way to West Adams Boulevard. The place was turn of the century stone block mansion, but the rest of the neighborhood had gone slumming a long time ago. I was about to try the knocker when I noticed a thin slice of pale light that said the front door wasn't closed all the way. I started in, edging toward the thick light that came from a single lamp in what used to be called the library. And then suddenly I saw him. A man in a smoking jacket, lavishly monogrammed A.B., his face beaten raw, his clothing almost shredded, blood clotted thick on the back of his head dead in the corner of the room. Next to the body was a heavy marble lamp base, also bloody. Inches from that, I found something that might as well have been Pete Andrade's calling card. The button made a green suede ahead of my pocket just before the company spoke up. Don't go for your gun, Marlowe. that will leave us even. So the kid finally made it, huh? Maybe. Maybe I did it, Connor. Nuts, you just came in, I know. I was waiting outside. The jerk I had on your trail lost you. I figured I'd better leave the office, but quick, I figured right. But tell me, Marlo, just so I score 100%, what's your angle? The Andrade kid's mother. I'm a private detective who was working for her. She was afraid of this. Oh, no. Stop. The sentiment's killing I me. wish something would. Well, let's call the police. Not so and... fast. What do you mean? I've already got the rest of my figuring done. But now the kid should be at his girlfriend, Helen Slat. I know where it is, and that's where I'm going. You see, Marlo, I want to be a hero. I want to bring the kid in. Understand? Oh, sure, sure. Real easy. You want to bring him in dead. That way nobody even mentions the beating you gave him on Brucher's orders. Because he wouldn't stay away from Helen. That way you're clean. Exactly. Clean as a whistle. Except for you and your big mouth. Now stand still, peeper. I want to whisper something in your ear. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you're going to think the laughter of April Fool's Day came late when you listened to CBS this Wednesday night. For it's going to be one of the craziest, merriest, maddest nights of entertainment you've ever heard. Bing Crosby will be playing host to Arthur Godfrey and Perry Como. And even though lots of singing is promised from all three, who knows what's going to happen when the gags start flying. Groucho Marx and Burns and Allen will also be on hand with their famous fun shows this Wednesday. 
These great stars will be here on most of these same CBS stations. Burns and Allen, Groucho Marx, and Arthur Godfrey and Perry Como as Bing Crosby's guests. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Man on the Roof. Told me with a 38 wrapped in his thick fist, I figured I'd better do something about him and do it fast. I waited until he walked around Bruce's body on the floor and it was out of his line of vision, and I pointed at it. Come on, look, look, he's moving. What's that? Hey, get out. Oh. An old quick now let's throw your gun out of the conversation. It was thought over. Come on, get up. Get your hands off. Get him off, you crummy. Look, Heavy, I'm going to get an answer out of you one way or another. Make it easy on yourself. Now get up. I said get up. Oh. All right. All right, what? You win this round. That's better. What do you want to know? Helen Castile's address. She's got her room. No, number four. 3,200 Crenshaw. How hey, hey. so long, muscles? I knew there wasn't much more I could do for a desperate hothead named Pete Andrade. He'd already done too much for himself in the wrong direction. I drove down at him until I'd cooled off enough to call the police. And I stopped at a phone booth and gave Homicide a fast rundown on Alex Bruce's murder. But I hung up before they could ask me Senora Andrade's address in San Fernando or Helen Castile's place on Crenshaw. Because there were two women I wanted to talk to alone before the police moved in. After that, I drove out to Crenshaw and found the number 3200. Room 4 was at the far end of a half-lit hall. And there were voices inside. One was Helen's. The other was Pete Andrade. I reached for my gun. I went out of my head, Helen. I must have hit him nine or ten times. Hard. What are we going to do? I don't know. I've got to speak. It's a little late for thinking, Pete. Who are you? He's a private detective. Yeah, I'm working for your mother. I was up until I left Bruce's place. He's dead, Pete. Pete. Oh, no. I didn't mean to kill him. But I'm not sorry. I want you to come along with me, Pete. Quietly. Turn yourself in. No. Helen, get away from me. Stop it. Oh, you little... He's gone. Yeah, I've got it. Don't move, Marlo. Don't move or I'll shoot. You crazy fool. I knew you wouldn't shoot me, Marlo. Next time you'll be surprised. There won't be a next time. We're going to get away. It's our only chance now. You haven't got a chance if you run. You'll be dogged every minute of your short lives. You'll wind up full of bullets in the dark. You'll be running down a blind alley and it starts right there with that door. Don't be suckers. Shut up. We're going to try it, Marlo. And we'll make it. We've got to have money, Pete. Yeah, and I know where to get it, too. Brewster always kept plenty of petty cash in the office at the warehouse. I'll take that. What about the watchman, Pete? Are you going to keep on killing? Pete, listen. You can get in quietly with Brewster's keys. Corey Haynes has them. The office keys are on the same ring as the car keys. She always borrows them when she uses his car, and she's got it tonight. Well, I'll get them from her. Where does she live? Out on Orange Drive. 210, I think. Will you uh, listen to me a minute? You're heading for the original dead end, both of you. Why don't you give yourselves a break? Now, what do you call a break, Marlowe? Feet rotting in some prison until we're both too old to care. I'd rather have the bullets. Let's get him out of here. That closet will do. Go on, Marlo, inside. Move. Sure, sure. What are you waiting for? Go on, close it. I know what you tried to do for my mother, Marlo, and for Helen and me. I'm sorry it couldn't work out. Thanks, anyway. Nuts. I'm leaving, Helen. I'm ready. You're not coming. You're staying here. What? Marlowe was right. This is a blind alley, a dead end, and I won't take you in. No, it. Pete, I'm going with you. No, you're not. Stay back. I mean it. Please. Stay back, I can't. <laughs> Ellen. Ellen, unlock this door. We still may be able to stop him. I'm playing this my way now, Marlowe. You can stay where you are. Helen, don't you understand? I'm, I'm on your side. Him. I'm going with him whether he wants me or not. So long, Marlowe. Happy landings, baby. The lock on the closet door gave up before I did, but only because it was older by several years. I got out of the house and kept the head of the speed limit all the way to Orange Drive and figured for what it was worth that I'd cut Pete's lead down to a scant ten minutes. I parked in front of a spudnut coffee shop on the corner and walked down to 210. By the time I got within knocking distance of Corey Haynes' front door, I could see that the only light in the place was spilling out of the sunken double garage that housed the new gray Nash. 
But when I moved closer, I knew that ten minutes was all that Pete Andrade had needed. Corey was sprawled out on the grease spattered concrete floor and very still. Very still. And standing limply against the wall was Helen Castile, staring down at the redhead with a pair of hopeless eyes that seemed already half dead. As I walked down the ramp, she heard me and looked up. I knew you'd get here. I don't care now. We're both late, is that it? Yeah. I didn't see him. He was already gone when I got here. Found her like that. Then he must have gotten the keys. Yes, from her purse. I see it over there. Uh-huh. Why didn't you follow him? He knew where he was heading. I couldn't. I, when I saw her there, I, I just couldn't because I think she's dead, too. No, no. She isn't dead. You mean she's just out? Yeah. A long way out, but not dead. From the looks of things, she must have put up quite a scrap. Maybe she... Wait a minute. What? There's something screwy here. I... Oh, oh Miss Corey. Miss Corey, what's happened? Who are you? Miss Corey's maid. What's happened to her? Well, she's unconscious. Oh, this is terrible. She knew there was going to be trouble. I swear she didn't. Miss Corey, honey, speak How do you know that? Because she was worried. She told me four or five times she was going to stay in all evening like she was expecting somebody. Sure, sure. It figures oh. all the way. Look, look here. Are you sure this is her purse? Certainly is. Was she robbed? Not exactly, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. This clenches it. Now, look, call an ambulance right away. Get Corey into a hospital and hurry. Oh, yes, sir. Helen, you stay here with her. Don't leave, understand? I'll see you. And that's it, Matthews. That's why I broke a few speed laws getting from Corey's garage down here to the warehouse. Because I had to find Pete and tell him before it was too late. I'm still not sure you made it, Marlo. Look. Look, this was dropped near Brucher's body. I just saw the mate to it in Corey Haynes' garage. Look, that's not conclusive. No, but these are. The papers I pulled out of her purse, take a look at them. Go yeah. ahead. One glance will tell you where they came from and why. You get it, don't you, Lieutenant? Yeah, I get it. Certainly I get it. What a rotten setup. Well, then you got to let me go up that fire escape and talk to him. He'll listen to me, Matthews. I know he will. I told you once before, Phil, he's been hit and he's cornered up there. Driven him haywire. Probably blow the top of your head off. But... Go ahead. Go on up and try it. I'll pass the word. They walked across the street and started up the fire escape. I knew Pete Andrade from someplace in the shadows on the roof was watching me. Every inch away. But I climbed up to the fourth floor before I spotted him. His head inched out over the ledge. My own thirty-eight in his hand. I, I went on to the fifth floor and, and started up the ladder to the roof when it came. Stop there. That's close enough. It's Marlow, Pete. I know. That's the only reason you got this far. You got lots of nerve, Marlow. Pete! I didn't bring a gun. Because I just came to ask you a question. Nothing else. A question? Yeah. A big one. Did you use anything on Brucher except your fist, Pete? No. Why? What's the difference? Plenty. I don't think you killed Brucher. What? Is this a trick? No, no. Look, it's Pete, a... no trick. Look at this. I found this green suede button near Brucher's body. I thought it came from your jacket, but it didn't. It was torn from a pair of green suede shoes that Corey Haynes had on tonight. Corey right, Haynes? Hey. I don't get you. It means first she's a liar. But she saw Brucher tonight. It means she got there after you did. Probably found him unconscious where you'd left him and finished the job with a heavy marble lamp base. You're crazy. This is a trick. Why would she kill him? They were going together. They had been. Until Brucher got interested in Helen. Yeah? After that, Corey was on the way out and she knew it. She decided to get all she could out of him while she had the chance. Every time she borrowed his car, she used the keys to get into the office, steal information out of the files, and sell it. She was the informer. Let's see. I'm coming up, Pete. How do you know, Holby? I found some papers to prove it in her purse. She was in a tough spot when Brucher changed his mind about leaving town tonight. Yeah? She had to get the papers back in the files or Brucher would discover they were missing. But Connor staying in the office prevented it. So she was trapped. Let's see. When she saw a chance to kill Brucher and have you blamed for it, she grabbed at it. Are you convinced, kid? I... I almost shot you, Marlo. Why did you take such a risk and climb up here? 
Because your mother has some ideas that I wouldn't like to see her lose, Pete. Also, I wanted my gun back. Well, do I get it? Yeah. Sure bet. Here. And thanks, Mom. I feel so good now. I guess I can. I just how you feel, kid. I don't climb fire escapes like this every night. Believe me. doctor in the prison ward had said that Pete would be okay and before Corey Haynes had put a wobbly signature to a full confession of murder. And still another hour went by as I drove out across the wide, flat valley to San Fernando, where the profile of the hills in the east had already begun to show against the gray dawn rising behind them. When I stopped in front of the little house and went up to the door, Senor Andrade was there on the porch. She waited all night. Her expression didn't change when I told her all that had happened. It didn't change, actually, until I was finally ready to leave. Then she put out her hand and took my arm. And the lines of worry in her face softened. Senor Marlo, last night I had but one son. Now this morning I have two. In my heart, you will always have a home. I am grateful. Gracias. She was most welcome. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced, directed, and transcribed by Norman MacDonald, and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Gerald Moore may currently be seen starring in Republic's The Blonde Bandit. Featured in our cast tonight were Virginia Gregg, Jack Edwards, Lillian Bieff, Doris Singleton, and Jack Crucian. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time a platinum wristwatch, a body on a lonely strip of beach, and a case of heart failure in a Beverly Hills garage. All added up to blackmail, 25 years old, and a killer... Who would never be caught? CBS invites you to hear one of the great ad-libbers in show business, Groucho Marx, every Wednesday night on most of these same CBS stations. Groucho Show, You Bet Your Life, finds the master throwing quips and questions at oddly assorted pairs of contestants. And it's fast, merry, and bright. So remember, be listening this Wednesday, won't you? disaster strikes, the Red Cross is on the spot to give relief in the emergency. But its work does not end when the wind dies down, the fire is out, or the flood recedes. It goes on in many different ways, helping to restore people to their normal way of living. The Red Cross is a great humanitarian service in which you have a very direct part because the funds which are used are the contributions which you make to the Red Cross. And they are funds used in a common-sense program that ensures the most good for the most people. 
Red Cross Disaster Relief and Rehabilitation is one of the great reasons why we must keep our Red Cross ready. All may help. Give now to the 1950 Red Cross Fund. Remember, whatever you gave before, this year, add a quarter more. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.